Um, we're going to hear now from Mr. Cam Minchway. Um, we are running a little bit over time, but apologies for that. We're going to hear now from Mr. Cam Minchway, who's an honorary consultant vitreoretinal surgeon at Oxford Eye Hospital and a Wellcome Trust Clinical Scientist Fellow at Oxford University. Um, as a clinician, Cameron's going to tell us a little bit more about the clinical application of some of these, uh, this amazing science. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, and thank you for the organizers and Retina UK. It's a fantastic opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, my name is Cameron Shrey. I work at the University of Oxford. I'm also a retinal surgeon by training. Um, I have a background in molecular biology. And over the last couple of years, I've been running my own group to research into developing new therapies for inherited retinal degenerations and ocular inflammation. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this quite easy to follow and uh, a practical, perhaps a patient's perspective of gene therapy from my experience. Uh, next slide. So I'm not going to go too much into the anatomy of the eye. Essentially, diseases we're talking about are affecting the film at the back of the eye that is responsible for detecting the light. Now this is consisting of various layers. The most important is a layer on the most outer side called the photoreceptors, consisting of cones and rods which detect light during the daytime and during the nighttime. The rods are particularly sensitive to gen degeneration and typically they die first in, in IRDs. So this is why the night vision is affected first. The cones tend to die secondary to the loss of rods. So if we're going to stop the loss of rods, we might slow down the degeneration of the cones, which are important for their central and the sharp vision. If you come to an eye genetics clinic, for example in Oxford, um, you will go through a very systematic review um, looking at your condition. And one of the important aspects is your history of how, how your condition progressed from an early age and also then the genetic testing. And this is now increasingly standard practice. We want to know what genetic mutation you harbor or your family members harbor so that we can then tailor the treatment uh, and know which treatment might work for you. Um, I wonder how many patients here are, have IRDs. Uh, do you mind raising a hand? Uh, and all your relatives. And how many of you know what mutations you have? So approximately half, perhaps. So currently, the genetic testing is, thank you, uh, is able to reveal about half of us uh, to find the mutation. In the other half of patients, we don't always find the mutation. And this is because the genetic code is very difficult to understand. Um, some of it makes sense, some of it is, is hard to interpret. So if you have a mutation in the parts that are hard to interpret, it's less certain that we'll be able to identify that mutation. But those can still cause disease. Um, once we know the mutation, we are starting to build up a big database of uh, how many patients with each type of gene, um, so that this is important to drive the research to know which diseases are important and also what patient population are potentially amenable to therapy. Um, currently, we're particularly interested in, obviously, retinitis pigmentosa, choroderemia, where we've already done gene therapy trials, but we're also increasingly interested in uh, diseases like age-related macular degeneration, where there's increasing understanding of the genetics behind it. It also runs strongly in families. Um, the disease goes through natural stages, as uh, Professor Lyle discovered, uh, or, sorry, that mentioned earlier already. Uh, in the early phase, you may have some functional loss, difficult with night vision, but you still have reasonable central vision. But in the later stages, you have loss of the cells. And that becomes a stage where it may be more difficult to rescue by gene therapy. Uh, because for gene therapy to work, we still need some living cells present to be modified. And once you reach that stage, perhaps you'll be a better candidate for cell therapy, such as in the previous talk, where we actually inject new cells to replace the cells that are already lost. The, I'm going to focus a bit more now on the gene therapy aspect. Uh, and in this, uh, in this therapeutic approach, we are essentially trying to, pr um, to use a viral particle or some other delivery device to carry a normal working copy of the gene into the cells of the retina. And hopefully that will be expressed and replace the, functionally, the functional defective gene. This has already reached um, clinical approval in the form of Luxterna for a rare form of Libra congenital amaurosis uh, to do with mutation RPE65. Obviously, this one affects a very small number of patients, 
um, but it sets a very good precedence of the model of such treatment and how it could be delivered you know, safely. And currently there are gene trials, uh, gene therapy trials ongoing for other conditions, uh, in particular X-linked retinal, uh, retinitis pigmentosa to do with RPGR. Um, so the sponsor Janssen is involved in running a trial at the moment, and so is another group in Oxford. Um, also, we have previously run trials on chorodremia, and that study will hopefully continue in the near future. Uh, there are other ongoing studies elsewhere on Stargardt's disease, wet and dry forms of macular degeneration, uh, and uh, possibly also other forms of macular uh, dystrophy. If you are coming in for gene therapy, what process could you expect? Well, you, you expect, whether it's in a clinical trial or for, uh, to approve treatment, a very thorough amount of tests to be done both before and after. Um, at, the, at the baseline, you'll have very detailed investigation of your retinal function. You'll have images, genetic testing to confirm that you have definitely the mutation that the treatment is targeting. And to undergo the treatment, you will need a period of immunosuppression. So typically that will be given a few days before and continued for a couple of weeks after to dampen down your immune response to the gene therapy. The delivery of the treatment itself is by a surgery, well, for, for most part at the moment, is something called vitrectomy, where we use keyhole technique to get to the back of the eye and inject the viral particles under the retina with an extremely fine cannula. Um, and that is then absorbed by the cells of the retina uh, in order to transduce those cells or affect them to introduce a gene. The gene then switches on in those cells over a few weeks. Um, and then we will monitor you very closely for any kind of immune response your body may mount to against the virus, which needs to be controlled. And that's why it's important to have very close for monitoring for the months afterwards. Hopefully you will have then a stable outcome at the end. And, and, then, and then because it's such a new therapy, we'll be interested in following up for many years, potentially lifelong afterwards. Uh, and we have a lot of patients who are continuing to see us on an annual basis, having had dream therapy now six, seven, eight years ago. Um, this is just a more detailed example of someone with chorodremia. Uh, this is a condition that's X-linked, but also females can be affected as carriers, but a lot more mild compared with males. Um, here are two brothers who actually underwent gene therapy on the same day. Um, they're 27 and 29. Uh, this is their images of their retina at the baseline. So you can see they have a typical scalloped island shape that is the remaining bit of retina, which the gene therapy is now targeting. So in the video, uh, you're seeing a, a very fine cannula being inserted through the retina, and the scans on the right are corresponding to those horizontal and vertical crosshairs on the picture, uh, where you can see a cross-section of the retina. You will, you will see that the retina is gradually being elevated by the injection of fluid, and at some point, you will also see the fovea, which is a very central dip in the retina, being detached uh, by the injection. Uh, this technique is now increasingly refined. At the very beginning, we, st we started doing that by hand. Obviously, it required to be very still. Um, and increasingly now, we are even developing robotic methods of um, de delivering this treatment even more um, slowly and safely. So these are the pictures after the surgery for these two brothers. Um, what we are interested in to find out is, is it detrimental to the retina to detach it? And we we're very grateful to find that actually the function improves or recovers very rapidly. Over a month, the visual retinal sensitivity by microperimetry reading comes back to the same amount as a baseline. So this tells us that the treatment could be delivered safely. And over the entire trial, um, of about, uh, I think, 14 patients in this study. Um, we, s we show good examples of individual treated eyes being improved in terms of visual function. And also in those eyes which already have a pretty high baseline, good vision at the beginning, at least they were maintained and there was no detrimental effect on the vision. Uh, as compared to the other eye that's untreated, which showed some steady decline. So the Chorodemia Gene Therapy Trial was showing very good promise. Um, subsequently, it was acquired by Biogen, a company, and they're carrying that forward. Um, but that's another story. So once a treatment reaches a certain stage, 
uh, it becomes too expensive for an academic institution to run, and we then require commercial sponsorship to continue such studies. Um, this is just a graph showing the overall cohort comparison, which I already mentioned. Uh, a second quick example is X-linked retinoschisis. This is to do with a gene called RPGR. Um, it is also an X-linked disease. It's the most common X-linked RP. Uh, and it accounts for about 20% of all RP, actually. So there's quite a lot of patients out there with this condition. Um, this condition affects a, a gene that has a very repetitive region. And when you have repetitive DNA, when it gets copied as it, the cell divides, it's very easy to get a mutation. And so in, in making this gene therapy, we had to modify the gene to make it less repetitive so that when we manufacture the gene in, in a um, lab environment, you can manufacture without making mistakes. So there's a lot of technical innovation that went behind the scenes to develop this uh, gene therapy. And here's a picture of someone receiving gene therapy for RP and in a very similar fashion, a subretinal cannula is being inserted at the edge of the macula. The, the orange dot in the center, that's the central vision. That is a fovea. So using OCT guidance, you can see a very steady and slow controlled detachment of the macular region, um, including the fovea. And this fluid uh, is absorbed by your body very quickly over just one day or so. And so the next day on the follow-up, the retina is already dry. Um, so when I ran this trial, I was quite excited one day looking at the, the results because uh, as you normally do, you just look at all the results and you file it away. But this one really caught my eye because uh, this, uh, I think it was one month or two months visit, um, I thought perhaps this fire was a wrong patient because I couldn't believe the visual field was from the same person. Um, and then we cross-checked it, triple-checked it. And it was indeed an improvement. And you can see a very obvious difference. On the left column, the treated eye shows an expansion of the area of vision compared with the right column, which was not treated. Also, we did even more detailed analysis of the scans in cross-section and found the treated eye actually shows a slight thickening of the retinal layers which suggests some low-level regeneration of the photoreceptor cells themselves, becoming more lined up. Um, so this was a patient who re received an intermediate dose of the gene therapy. Subsequently, the trial went up in dose to see if there's an even stronger effect, um, but then actually then discovered some cases of inflammation. And it highlights a very important thing, that is, in gene therapy, there is dose-related inflammatory response in the retina, even though we believe the retina is relatively immune privileged. It's not exactly immune, uh, completely immune privileged. Um, so you see here, this patient, despite initial improvement, then after the immunosuppression drugs were stopped, two weeks later, he developed a sudden drop in vision. And he called us to say, something's not right. I can't see again. It, it's gone back to normal. Um, so we brought him back and did a scan and found little bumps under the retina. Um, so these corresponded to sites of inf infiltration of immune cells, and we therefore then put him back on immunosuppressants. And actually, he responded really well, and within a few weeks, his vision then recovered to the improved level that he experienced in the first place. And he continued to do well a few years after down the line now. So in summary, I think RPGR gene therapy is a very promising mode of treatment for this condition. Uh, whether it is the Janssen trial or the Oxford trial, I think there's good hope that we will soon have a treatment for this disease, and uh, it brings a lot of hope to other treatments of this type. What about the future for gene therapy? There are certainly many challenges. We are now recognizing incidences of inflammation in patients uh, receiving Luxterna, so that is an aspect that's very important to, to control the inflammation with novel treatment, perhaps with more targeted immunosuppression regimes. Uh, we are now in developing new treatments involving CRISPR technology, which Professor Moore mentioned, uh, and that brings up obviously lots of new ethical issues of off-targeting, but also regulatory issues of how do we prove treatments that are so individualized, um, how what is a safe level of safety margin, and how much improvement can we expect? Um, because traditional clinical trials focus on 
improvement in vision, but that's not always possible. We're looking more for preservation of vi vision. So some of these endpoints need to be worked at. And also, if you do have a condition and currently there's no treatment for you, um, it is still very worthwhile being seen in clinic on a regular basis because you're providing the natural history data for us to justify the funding to get the, to study your disease and develop treatments for it. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I acknowledge <laughs> my collaborators.